systems thinking or systemic thinking. Remember that? It's been sleeping. Dormant. It's been there in the background. It's been... It's been there. It wasn't gone. But I think it's back. It's back and it's... uh, There's a whole new generation of people embracing systems thinking. And uh, I'm very happy. I'm happy it's back. It's been a very uh, rich source of inspiration. And uh, I always felt that there was a very deep truth to what systems thinking was trying to teach us. The only thing that was a bit of a problem with systems thinking or systemic thinking is that it um, was made so complicated that the people who you know, was supposed to benefit, just didn't know how to apply it. They didn't know how to use it to their benefit. I'm very happy it's back and, um, you know, in a very simplistic way, somehow I feel that if you put everything together, all the buzzwords and the theories and the frameworks and the methodologies, you know, lean, uh, lean startup, Agile, Six Sigma, uh, Design Thinking, Service Design, UX, I, I don't know, you name it. If you mash all that together, somehow I feel that you end up with, with systems thinking. Um, it is the system in the end. It's always systemic. Every problem and every solution uh, needs to be systemic. So I'm very happy it's back and um, I, I, I hope it also means that uh, surface dominant logic is, uh, is going to be enriched by this. And if you're not familiar with surface dominant logic and value networks and, uh, and how value flows through systems, uh, um, check out sdlogic.net. Um, anyway, so I'm, I'm happy it's back. Let me know what you think. Uh, is it back uh, or has it never left? Did I just forget about it? Um, I don't know. Let me know. Today on the show is uh, Pak Chu. Pak is a uh, fashion psychologist. And uh, he has an amazing story. I think he should write a book. I think he really should write a book. I'm not going to share much um about the things we're, t- we're talking about, because I, I, it will be a, a spoiler. So uh, I uh, I hope you enjoy this conversation. I sure did. So here we go. Yellow, I think. That's how I like to describe myself. I'm a yellow color that floats around in Amsterdam, which is generally a gray, rainy town. Um, and yeah, I like to admit yellowness. And I think to me, it's um, how people describe me is just to stay on the optimistic side. And I always like the phrase, which I always get it wrong, is it glass half empty or glass half full? I just feel like that's, that's to me what I, I, I can't really describe myself more, as in there's always a possibility somewhere here and there. And I don't like to see myself as an object. I think I just like to see myself as, yeah, as like, I don't want to say an aura because that then goes into biblical ways, but like, yeah, like, like, like uh, a, a infectious color. There you go. That's how I would like to describe myself. Is that uh, weird? Is that weird? <laughs> <laughs> no, it made me think uh, if I would choose a color, uh, what yeah. color I would choose, and I think uh, I I would lean towards blue, um, okay. uh, which is uh, but but at the same time it 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 has I think to me a different meaning than to many other people. So blue, blue for yeah. me is uh, is sort of the is endless, you know it's uh, it's it's open and it's uh, it's the blue sky and it's uh, that that's sort of what uh, so blue is blue to me is is sort of this endlessness and. Um, openness um yeah. and it's not uh, but i think a lot of people would say it's cool or cold or but but uh, i don't think blue is cool cool or cold at all it's actually quite a no. it's kind of yeah. it's, it's also warm yeah. um 
I that's what we like mean. Blue, as in like the ocean, which is opportunity. But but what 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 is being blue like in Harlem? You know, <laughs> what is it like being? In yourself and well, so blue also. So it, there's 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 different yeah. uh, uh, ideas around mm-hmm. colors, right? So blue. Uh, mm-hmm. I also know that for for some people it means uh, structured. Like you're when you're blue, like you're structured. You're like a blue consultant to oh. us. It's always, almost like a, you know, you're very, yeah. you know, you're very linear and very structured. And that blue. That's not what I mean. Mm-hmm. It's for me, blue. The, yeah. the emotion blue is totally different. So I don't understand that connection at all. For me, blue is is actually totally different. It's openness and it's endlessness yeah. and it's it's continuous and it's. Uh, uh, and it, it's, yeah. you know, it's freedom yeah. and it's, uh, and it's nature and it's, uh, um, uh, yeah, I think that, and it's, yeah, it's the ocean and it's, it's flowing and it's, yeah. it's that, that's to me blue, yeah. but yellow, yeah. yellow is, is it warm? Is it, is it, is it, is it, is it cheerful? What is it? yellow to me is spring. Yeah. Okay. I like that. Yeah. It is more spring, but blossoms, isn't it? It's kind of yeah. that color of, it reminds me of daffodils when I first moved to the, to the UK and uh, it's, yeah, yellow is pretty much, yeah, spring is pretty daffodil season. Um, going back to the point is that I definitely can't perceive myself as structured. Although I like having structure because it gives me a little bit of space during the day, but I always tend myself always just not following it properly. So maybe that's a good thing to choose yellow just because I don't think yellow is about structure. I think yellow is about connecting to me. It's about um, um, perhaps on the on the on the negative side it's quite invasive you know it's yeah and and maybe sometimes that i could be very like uh enthusiastic passionate about something that it could be a bit much but but yeah i think that's how i describe myself really just a general blob of yellow navigating <laughs> out to that <laughs> when, but when is it a bit much when you when you feel like oh you know a little, a little bit too much uh, enthusiasm I think, yeah, I think, I think it's, um, I think maybe I've always been a bit on the emotive side, but it's generally like happy emotions. Um, I think, yeah, I, yeah, I, I love the idea of just speaking with, with that language, I think. Um, so, you know, I share a lot of emotions. I think share emotions is such a important thing nowadays. Um, this year, I think, is quite hard because sharing emotions is very different. Like, I think, you know, if we are doing this podcast in person, like, it will be, like, very different than just mm. doing it over the screen, isn't it? And so it's, mm. it's just, yeah, yeah, I think it's that share emotion, that connecting, um, that always enthusiastic um, and also always, you know, it could manifest itself in little small talks. And uh, again, having lived in the UK and now Amsterdam, I realised that um, Western culture don't particularly like too many sorts, too much small talk with people they don't know or people they just know or you know things like that. Compared to Hong Kong, like a, a, a Hong Kong Chinese original culture that Hong Kong kind of has, um, yeah. So it could be a bit like whoa, you know, uh, more personal boundaries. Uh, not that I usually cross it. I think my psychology career has helped me understand like uh, mm. what is the right amount. But yeah, if I can, I would love to kind of infect everyone with a little bit of yellowness. I think that's, that's what I like to do. That's, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, yeah. And so, um, so you, 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 um, mm. you, you mentioned quite a few things that are, um, Interesting to kind of dive a little deeper into. For instance, um, you're you're clearly not originally from Amsterdam, but you moved. <laughs> but you you moved. To, when did you when did you move to Amsterdam? I actually moved to Amsterdam. Well, uh, me and my partner, uh, we moved to Amsterdam in the year of the Brexit. So um, uh, we've, I've been I've been living in the UK. Um, been living in the UK, actually London, since uh, for 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 my twenties. Uh, you know, like kind of learning to be an adult during my twenties in London. And then Brexit mm-hmm. happened, and then we 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 took the opportunity to move because my partner got a job here. But uh, my work hasn't stopped in London until March, uh, right. April or March. Okay. So I flew. I used to fly back 
once a month to London for various reasons. Mm. Um, and then it's really since March that I felt like actually Amsterdam is where my home is. Um, I think the difficulties with London were so close, so you never really mm. felt like you left there when every fourth week you, you're already kind of sure. flying back. So I moved here for maybe three years now, and since April is when I really have to kind of go, well, okay, so if, if, if this is our life, then what happens in Amsterdam, right? You know, what, what, what does Amsterdam look like for me? Um, definitely very grey, very rainy, but also very, very human compared to living in London, which, which is... Is it greyer than London? I think so. I think really? so. London, surprisingly, is not as rainy as other parts of the UK, that's how I always feel. Mm -hmm. So um, before London, I, uh, I studied in Sheffield, um, so, which is one of the hilliest uh, areas in, in the UK. Uh, one of the hilliest cities, I think. So again, a huge contrast to Amsterdam, which is probably mm -hmm. one of the least hilliest cities in the Netherlands. Um, and then before that, I, uh, I grew up from nine to 18 in a place called Nottingham. So uh, right. it's uh, known to, uh, very, very much known as like the Sherwood Forest, Robin Hood, that's how <laughs> people know it. And uh, for people yeah. who lived in the UK though, they know it's like one of the top three kind of uh, most crime cities in the UK as well. So they have a very- ah, um, is, there a relationship, is there a relationship to Robin Hood? I don't know what is that, that's Robin yeah, Hood obviously. Yeah, but but I mean, like, I, I couldn't see any benefits for the tour. So, I mean, no. maybe, not, maybe not that much. Uh, but yeah, but I always have that, that kind of, um, yeah, that kind okay. of life where, where just be moving around. Um, but in Nottingham, you were, that's where you were born? Uh, I was, uh, no, we moved out to Nottingham. I moved to, me and my brother moved to Nottingham when we were nine. Nine, uh, okay. It was back in, it was just before 1997. Yeah. Uh, because of, uh, where we're from, Hong Kong, was being handed over back to China. Mm -hmm. So um, Hong Kong was run by the UK. My dad was right. working for the British government that was in Hong right. Kong. So we were allowed to to apply to to come over to avoid ah, any, so. any conflict. Okay, so you were actually born in Hong Kong? Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. Every yeah, okay. summer when we were young, we used to go back to Hong Kong because uh -huh. that was the time we get to see our parents. So we and were, so when... We were, yeah, so when the handover was, that was the time your parents said, we are going to move to the UK. Yeah. Was that related to yeah, you? Was yeah, yeah. Uh, it was, yeah, it was. They were, in fact, they never moved uh, because their, their work was always based in Hong Kong. So it was just me and my brother. Oh, sorry. Uh, go back. Uh, go back a few steps. I missed that one. <laughs> yeah. So, so your parents didn't move. No. They, no, they stayed in Hong no. Kong. Yeah, yeah, they stayed in Hong Kong. And, and you and your brother, and brother. moved yeah, to yeah, Nottingham. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we were, we were, we were both. So he moved a year before me because we moved when we were eight. So he was older, so he moved a year before. Then I moved a year after. So uh, where where did you who took care of you? <laughs> so like, uh, wow. Where did you? Where, how do you send your children? <laughs> where did you go? <laughs> no, we uh, we had uh, yeah more or less a uh, a distant family member here uh, mm, that okay. um, that worked as a uh, in uh, Chinese takeaways. So okay. back in the nineties and still now probably mm -hmm. a lot of uh, people from Hong Kong or Asia will come to Europe. To open mm -hmm. Chinese restaurants. Yes. Business. Yeah, yeah, of course. And um, and we were, we have a family member who was, so okay. uh, we stayed with them. Uh, we kind of ne really never saw them, so they were just kind of there, but not there. So in a way, we had a quite a good life. You know, imagine you were like eight or nine, and you know you don't have parents telling you what you're supposed to do and what you're not supposed to do. Um, so yeah, back then it was, um, it was, it was fun, but looking back, actually, it wasn't that great to be, to be a kid without parents. I think that's, yeah, there, but that was, yeah, that was, that was fine. We go back every summer and, um, and until we're about 18, when we realized that actually we can 
go elsewhere in the world and and I think living in the UK and just just maybe like separating quite early from our parents like we we never really felt like Hong Kong was home or UK was home so so traveling just became quite a thing there was not mm. much of a of, of a baggage maybe or attachment mm, I sure it, so. I'm I'm yeah. I'm still curious because uh, that's this is quite a story this is, wow. is, is, this is quite, I mean, I mean, for, I mean, I don't know if that's common <laughs> for people <laughs> from Hong Kong to send your children over to uh, the other side of the world. Um, uh, but, but no, but I, I'm, I mean, they must have had a very good reason for it, I, I'm assuming. So what was their, what was their reason? Is it, why didn't they want you to, and your brother grow up in, uh, in Hong Kong? I think we came from, so uh, going back to the point, during the uh, 90s, uh, the point you made about was there quite a lot of um, uh, students, let's say, traveled to Europe for, for, to, to just stay. It was just because uh, a lot of uh, European education has always been seen as, mm -hmm. as kind of more advanced and better okay. um, than, than in Hong Kong. So um, a lot of people do. Um, not like, you know, like not loads, but at least more than, than, than a niche. So mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, there was enough. Um, I think the difference was that a lot of those came from, yeah, like a, a quite wealthy family, but, but, uh, we weren't really, uh, my dad was a policeman and my mum was a, a beautician. So they, they had this opportunity and, they just, they also came from a family where they, they, were, they never had opportunities before. So right. I guess we were the guinea pig, really, of being <laughs> like, actually, there's an opportunity for what they said, a better life. Um, right. why, don't, why don't we do it? Um, um, I mean, uh, maybe a lot of Asian, it, if, uh, you know, people from Asia listening to the podcast later, they might not agree with this, but my interpretation of Asian kind of family it's all about kind of uh, sacrifice. It's all about, um, you know, working hard to achieve what you want to achieve. Um, you know, losing things makes you stronger. And, and to them, especially to my dad's side of the family, it's all about, well, you know, this is kind of like military camp. This is kind of like, this is what you learn. You're going to be a stronger person by being away from us and, 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 right. and kind of, et cetera. Okay. So yeah, that was their decision. Yeah. And um, and I guess we were too young to argue that decision. <laughs> Can you remember that moment? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I remember that. Yeah, usually it's, uh, my dad would come over with us for the first. Uh, so, well, so again, my brother moved first. Um, my dad came with him for two weeks, settled him into our, our uncle's house, and then spent another week there and then fly back. And for me, he also did the same thing as well. And um, it was really sweet. He usually gets us a toy before we leave, before he leaves. So that's uh, maybe that's kind of like what parents do. Like, I, I'm not a parent yet, so I guess it's so hard for me to understand their world they had as well, to, yeah, yeah, yeah. to not feel financially as secure, but yet taking a risk but also risking something that is very close to them. So I think that, mm, yeah. yeah, it'd be so exactly. interesting to hear. My mom is much more vocal about it, but my dad is still not really talking about it. It just, it just happened kind of thing. So, right. um, and your, but, yeah, your mother, yeah. but your mother is more vocal about it. What, what, what does she say when she talks um, about that? She just says um, things she misses. Like she miss, like, um, I think she just missed being a mum. I think mm. that's, that's what she yeah, missed. Yeah. And, um, and she always say, I wish, I wish you both are young again so we can spend time together. I think that's, yeah, that's it. I mean, she's like yeah. totally like, no, she's, she's still in her 60s. She, she used to come over once a year and we used to go back to see her. So we see actually our family quite a lot during the last couple of years. Mm. But I think, you know, there's always that, I think for her, like there is something that, she felt she missed yeah, a huge part of, of her life. I think yeah. she missed. And, uh, and, you know, we grew up, I think my brother always said, this, especially me, I grew up being very accepting of, of the English culture. So like sometimes a lot of things I do, I say, 
my parents just was like, you're being bizarre because, you know, like, how did you love this? and all that stuff and yeah yeah but choosing to work in psychology i think for a typical asian working class family is very bizarre which is is not is not the most uh, ideal career they think they yeah think I, of course we can yeah. Have. yeah then i chose fashion psychology which is even more bizarre because that bad. doesn't even exist i'm sorry but <laughs> that's not even a thing that's weird. everyone thinks that's weird what do you mean fashion psychology what, what, what are you talking about no seriously so i can imagine that at least there's some question marks like are you okay <laughs> yeah yeah psychology yeah. and now what so but yeah, we'll get to yeah. we'll get to that moment later we'll get to that moment later you're you're speeding things up here and i and i Sorry. because i'm really you're I, in my mind you're still eight <laughs> oh that's and, very kind of you yeah and uh, <laughs> and you are you're you're living with your uncle yeah. you, you moved so I'm, i have a son he's eight he's eight yeah. so i you know i can kind of so i can relate to that very much and also to me because it's interesting because um uh, uh if i if i would imagine that you know what your your, your parents decided to, to do uh, they, uh, in my mind and knowing that i mean i think parents in general love their children and so your parents you know were you know uh, listening also to your mother and probably also your father who doesn't want to talk about it it has been a very emotional decision for them but it must have been such an amazing compelling reason for them to do so in order to do, to do to do this right because you know what you're going to miss and, and you don't have so it's it's it is it's although you have amazing good reasons still it's still an emotional thing for everyone involved so you're thinking about my son that i would send him say to hong kong or you know or new zealand or i don't know it doesn't matter but far away a different yeah different time zone different uh you know no but the, but sort of that there must have been an amazing uh, reason, but also trying to kind of get into his head, um, you know, that would be, you know, it, it does something, you know, you're a psychologist, so you, you might be able to say it does something to you as a, as a child, but let, let me, let me just go to your, you know, your age, you're eight years old, you go, you go live with your uncle, you get all the freedom because your uncle is working very hard, probably, uh yeah, you know yeah, right so yeah, so they yeah. don't so they don't they don't they're not parenting you and your brother um no no i, I think also <laughs> because they they also in a way they also have the freedom as well like in hong kong hong kong is such a small place where the size of hong kong if i remember is the size of i think of smaller than london but yet the population is is reaching 10 million or something ridiculous like this. Um, yeah. I think even for my the uncle that I used to live with, um, I think it was also freedom for them. They nice. moved about three years before us, if I remember correctly. Right. And they didn't have to deal with all the kind of the, the issues of living in Hong Kong. And also as an adult in a new city, and I can kind of see that in Amsterdam, being adult in Amsterdam, and maybe perhaps just reflecting being adult for them in, in a new city, regardless of what the, where the city is. There must be so much opportunities and things you want to explore. Right. And I think we, at that time when we arrived, it wasn't really within their mindset to, to stay put or, or to have like more of a nurturing side, maybe. Mm. So, yeah, yeah, I still remember kind of coming off the airplane and um, they used to show me all these photos of, of the UK where it's kind of like lots of towers everywhere, uh, Big Ben and, you know, like uh, Buckingham Palace. But it was the first time seeing a motorway, a motorway next to um, these kind of big kind of... Uh, uh, kind of grey buildings I remember it must be like a deco centre and things like that and they just continue for like about two hours until we get back home so it was such a different experience of of what what I thought it was and I also remember that when when I first came well first landed let's say 
um, it just finished snowing. And as a kid living in Hong Kong that we never traveled anywhere, you know, we always thought snow was in children's books or in Disney films, you know, it's so beautiful. But I remember the snow that I saw was, it's kind of beautiful in its own way, like snow on motorways when it's mm. just all mm. like slushy gray <laughs> and on the side it's still white, but you know, it, just, it didn't meet your expectation. It was like, no, mm. no, no, it had a, it had a more of a, like a, how can I say it in a better way? It more have a, like a brutalist feeling about it, which is, you know, a good trend sometimes. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but as a nine year old, no. And, um, and my parents sometimes say it as well. Is, um, so that was 1994, I knew. And the only thing that existed in, in a typical household was a landline, not even the internet, not even mm. a dial-up internet. So we used to be able to speak to each other once a week, usually on the Saturday and Sunday. And again, as a, as a kid, I think you just, you don't really know your emotions that well. And you, you just get on with things. And, and I was like, oh, like, you know, it must be really hard for our parents to try to engage us on the phone. So I don't know, do you ever talk much on the phone with your eight-year-old as well, where our concentration levels maybe is not high? Oh, <laughs> no. no, 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 that, that's, that, those are very short conversations. And it's, it is me asking questions. And at, at the same time, he is doing all kinds yeah. of other things. Like yeah. he would be like, yeah, mm, yeah, I was cool. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, nice. Yeah, yeah. Well, so how? So what did you do at school? Yeah, some things. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, so and uh, oh, here's Mama. You know, <laughs> like. But I. Oh, all right. Yeah. But uh, yeah, that, that, like just audio. I mean, if it's video nowadays, you have yeah. you know you can. So that's different. It's still not. I mean, we still don't have like lengthy conversations, but in that sense. But uh, no. But it's actually. Um, yeah, ex exactly. So, yeah, that's a, yeah. so if you just have a landline, yeah, you know, that's, that's a, a very, that's the minimum of uh, connection yeah. that you have then with your, uh, with, your yeah. with your, with your parents or with your child. Yeah. And I just wonder like what, what, how my parents felt back then when, you know, they probably expected that from us, you know, just the eight year old, a nine year old, how much, how much conversation, how deep can you get of a conversation with them? Um, well, you don't really know when you, no. I mean, as a parent, I mean, unless you already had like, you know, maybe you're, they experienced yeah. the same with your brother or something, like if you have an, yeah. uh, an older brother or sister, but if, if you are like, you know, like now I have, I have a teenage mm -hmm. daughter. I never had a teenage daughter. I don't know what to expect <laughs> at all. So I don't know. I don't know what that's like. <laughs> I mean, I, to be a parent, to be a parent of a teenager, I, I didn't know what it was like to be a parent you know, of a baby, yeah. of a of a of a of a of a, of a, of a four year old, a five year old, six year old. Seven, that's it's all like a discovery for parents. So I can imagine for them, it's also, you know, they might not have thought mm. that through uh, to that detail. Like, oh yeah, so we can't have like there's yeah. no real conversation. So how are you doing? Yeah, okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. <laughs> all right. I mean, well, What's making me curious is that, like, how do how do kids show kindness to their parents? You know, they, that that will always be dependent on the parents in the parents' eyes. Really, what do they? How do they see their kid giving them affection and kindness? And and oh yeah, and to listen. And I think you know, yeah, well, in in mysterious ways, I can tell you, <laughs> in mysterious ways. <laughs> No, <laughs> no, 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 by, by doing things they would never do. So for instance, um, if my, my kids can be very well behaved if they are amongst people, they don't know really well. Okay. And yeah. so they can be very nice and well behaved. They don't get, you know, they, they might not get, uh, you know, might, might not be in fights together as much when they're home. <laughs> they're not well behaved. Um, <laughs> they're not kind at all. They're not nice at all. They're not nice at all. They try stuff out. They look for the boundaries. They look for the for what what is what what, what can I get away with? That is that is trust. They so it yeah. is they trust you 
and and that is actually a way of showing affection not like literally i mean i mean affection literally would be my kids are very physical so they they will cuddle and they, you know they, so mm. so they mm. th so that's you know but that's mm. that's affection sure but uh, but it's also the other side of mm. you know that they are they feel they they feel that they're safe enough to mm. try stuff out to to see yeah. whether you know to kind of stretch the boundaries to say <laughs> how far how far can i take this until my father that's really yeah really <laughs> angry <laughs> and i and i yeah and so as a parent you have to learn to be to the, i i really i when i had a kid my first first of all if you have a kid that's the moment you get become a parent before that you have no clue when yeah. your child is born like oh Oh, that's it. Um, how it just like in a moment. But but the thing is that I I didn't have a, an angry voice. I I don't have an I didn't have I never had I never okay. had to be angry at anyone. Like stop yeah. doing that now. <laughs> you know, yeah, like yeah. you know, you had to kind of say this is the boundary. This is the you know because yeah. I need to give you some restrictions here, and and you're not listening to me when I just say it kindly, when I say, can you please stop? <laughs> please, can you, just for me, I don't like you doing this. Can you please stop? They, so they were like, I walk all over you. So you have to kind of, you know, because they'd be crying in a supermarket. So my daughter, my son, not, not anymore, but they, not, which yeah. is 14. <laughs> but she would lie on the ground, kicking and screaming because she wanted to have this candy, right? Yeah. And I'd be- which is well, yeah. you know, yeah. it's like, and then I was, I would be like, you know, at first, first thing, time you experience that, you're like, no, but sweetheart, you know, but I, no, it's not good for you, and no, you, and no, I'm, I'm not going to buy you the candy. You, you, and by the way, we have some candy at home. It's fine. <laughs> I want you guys, and we're like, how do I? How do I? What is the? Where's my? I need it. My where's my personality? Where's the script? Where's the script? <laughs> Where what, what part is this, right? So, so yeah, yeah, right. So, yeah. so children show kindness and affection, sure, but in very mis like in mysterious ways that you start have to realize as a parent, like, oh, yeah. that's because they feel safe. They they yeah. they can do this because because you start noticing that when they're with strangers, they don't do that at all. <laughs> You're like, why do you? Why are you so well behaved? And people, are, they're so sweet. They're so sweet. They're so nice. So, oh, they're so well behaved. And we're like, yeah, all right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Borrow them for a couple of weeks, you know. But, but with really good friends. So that was my yeah. sort of the, the you know the proof is in the in the in, in, in the pudding, is that when we're there with friends, they trust yeah. really good friends of ours and theirs, and they trust them. They do show that behavior too, and then yeah. their friends are like, "What's happening?" They say. Hey, they really like you because <laughs> yeah. they are, you know. <laughs> they're just being themselves now. <laughs> yeah, they're being themselves. Yeah, I think. Congratulations. That yeah, yeah, but I think yeah, I think that also speaks a lot about. Yeah, I think I think just like thinking back to how we grew up, it's um, it's uh, it's it's different because I think with parents, you you feel like you can, you know, like you can poke them. You can stretch the boundaries. You can test out the boundaries because at the end of the day, you know that they're there. It's, there's something unconditional about it. And there's something, like you said, safe about, mm, about yeah, things. Exactly. And I think it's the, it's the unconditional bit that, that I think for me and my brother, we, we never really understood. And I think we, we never really kind of got to grips with it because I think if we kind of have messed up in any way when we were young it was pretty much that there isn't much people around so well that there isn't anyone around so we uh, i think i think that's the bit that we miss from our parents i think that's the bit that our parents miss as well just not yeah. being there to to say everything is okay i think yeah. or to mm. to to emit that kind of that kind of that kind of feeling in the room that it's fine you can be whoever you want whatever you want to be because right. um because that wasn't the case i guess for us which is yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. which is really interesting but um yeah that's, a, was, that's uh, a very uh, that's a very british way 
of saying it's very interesting. <laughs> like, it's not just interesting. <laughs> yeah, basically, it's very rubbish. But, yeah, say it's but, interesting for now. but it can be many different things. It usually doesn't mean interesting. It usually means something else. Yeah. It, is, it is very interesting, but it's uh, it's actually quite uh, profound and and, uh, and uh, important. Um, how uh, so? Do you went to school? So you, yeah. you you know so so how how did was your experience when you you came to the UK? Nottingham, no Robin yeah. Hood, only gray buildings. Yeah, gray, <laughs> slushy gray snow. Gray buildings. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and then you and then you went to school. What what was yeah. your what was your experience? Uh, there? So our school was so we moved to a town and that was quite small. Um, we so me and my brother, uh, one one other person, which I'm still friends with, were the only Asian kids there so it was just us and like 1400 other 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 kids um and the language was a problem for the first few years but i also realized that actually it wasn't so much of a big deal because maybe we were still young and i think at that age children doesn't rely as much on language i don't know because you didn't speak english because because no. I mean, because people some people in Hong Kong do actually speak English. Yeah, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. We but were you taught didn't. English, but it's it's just never the same, really. Just because uh, our English mm. when we get taught is usually about alphabet and about you know writing oh, alphabet. Sure, sure. Yeah. And um, and uh, in the UK, there's a variation of accent as well. Mm -hmm. So it's the accent that that really kind of threw me. Um, my school gave me an extra tutor which uh, she was uh, Scottish. So English school with her English accent. <laughs> you got a my, my English well. tutor was a Scottish <laughs> lady. <laughs> oh, I can see the picture. Oh. So it was, yeah, it all became a little bit of a... Totally confused. <laughs> but, but I think yeah, it, was, it was quite easy. We all had a bike. And mm. um, you just cycle everywhere. You knock on each other's doors. And... Mm, okay. and People just join you and you cycle around. You know, the town wasn't that big. And the town was one of those towns they demolished to rebuild. So everything is safe. And, um, and yeah, just grew up in a town like that. Um, and slowly but surely just start pick up the language, pick up the culture. And, and I think by, by high school or 13 or 14, you know, you don't really see yourself as different to others anymore mm -hmm. even though we were still the only three or maybe there was one more other chinese kids in school we were just uh yeah and 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 i don't i didn't felt our friends or people in school saw us differently but when you know, looking back yes of course there will be difference but but as a kid i don't think you see it and okay. as, as, as other teenagers i don't think they judge you as harshly as as what happens you know in in adult life, let's say. So, um, okay. yeah, yeah. So, actually, once I picked up the light, well, yeah, once they were able to communicate, it was, it was fine. Okay. Um, uh, but, you know, it, it's, uh, it's, it was a very, yeah, it was a very interesting experience. Can I say <laughs> There's the interesting again. Yes, very yeah. interesting experience. <laughs> So, <laughs> so what, okay, so, so, all right, yeah. so you, you go to yeah. this primary school, okay, yeah. so you, um, you know, you, you're living with your uncle and your brother, um, yeah. uh, you, basically, the way you describe it, to me, it sounds like you, you're living without parents, parenting, yeah. so, yeah. All right, so, which is, to me, it's like, wow, that's, I can't, I can't, I, I don't think I can get there with, in my head how how that would be but but uh, the positive side obviously was all the freedom that you had to kind of just be whatever you wanted to be and who you yeah. were um yeah. you didn't feel yeah. that you were being treated differently at school so that sounds okay well you but you missed the your parents um, yeah 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 yeah, I think so. Yeah, that's a good okay. summary so far. Yeah. yeah, and then and then uh, and then you um, uh, you know you grew up and you uh, so then you what 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 happened next? Where did you go to school? Uh, you moved uh, like so yeah. you moved. Yeah, what? I think. And why did you move? Think, or did your did your uncle move? 
No, no, we actually moved away from them. How so, old were you? 16, around 16. So we, 16 or 17. Oh God, I can't remember now. Um, it was, yeah, like, uh, um, yeah, we, I think I had a better relationship with the friends I met through school than, than um, living at home because the home environment wasn't great. So it was pretty much just, yeah, there was a lot of other kind of extra curricular things that my 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 guardian, let's say, was doing. So we really just got into. I think at the quite a young age, we were thrown into a lot of kind of like, can I say, adult challenges? Maybe there's a lot of like relationship challenges that we observed, like when we're where we're living, um, and um, there was a lot of kind of. Yeah, can I thing. can I open that door? Is that a, yeah, you, you just because yeah, yeah. that like this <laughs> all right? Just like like giving you a little peek and yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting, I would say. Um, <laughs> where what, what what exactly are you talking about? So you're you know what what do you what are the other yeah, activities? Yeah. Are, so I think I think um, a guardian wasn't the uh, I, yeah again I think just going back to the intention that. Mm. that we didn't realize i guess when we were young but we'll get the teenager that their intention was never really for us their intention was their life is here they're taking us on because we're, we're supposed to be family and also there's um you know to say it quite frankly you know for them there's a bit of income for them as well sure. but okay. they also they were they were yeah they were negotiating they were navigating and living their life here in the in, in nottingham and uh, and they got themselves into a lot of, you know, just um, just a lot of relationship issues, and and a lot of um, kind of like witnessing a lot of perhaps bullying each other, um, you know, just just marital breakdowns and right. So, but this is your uncle and your aunt. yeah 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 yeah, and then and then we became their their pawns. If, if that's the way to say yeah, it, so right, sure, we sure. became yeah. like kind of the the thing. That, yeah, like we, yeah, we we should have been involved, but we were involved. But I think the thing is, like, we cannot retaliate because they're not really our parents. Mm. We're never close enough, right. and and there's still this gap, this distance that they've always created that mm. we we can never cross. Okay. So. Um, by the time that I mean that started, we're about eleven. But by the time that I was sixteen or seventeen, again, still quite fake now. Um, well, anyway, one of those legal ages that you can start renting a um, a room to lodge. So, so yeah, I rented a room to lodge because my brother was already in university. So I so it must be about seventeen then. Um, I, I just finished um, my my A levels. They call it in the UK. Mm. In in a, in a lodger's house, which is very interesting. So just a house yes. with a lot of people just rented different rooms, and um, and uh, some sketchy people, some not sketchy people. But that was, I guess, my first taste of being an adult and and just just yeah. looking after myself and at sixteen, seventeen. Yeah. 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 That's, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's also very young, but then at the same time, because I, so my first response, sort of, or my first feeling is like, wow, that's so young. Like, I can't imagine, like, my, that would be my daughter in two years. Like, that's, no, that's impossible. But at the same time, you, you know, you, you kind of, you grew up uh, very independent anyway. So, you, you know, you had a, a childhood that kind of uh, wasn't yeah. that common or not that, uh, regular so you had to take care of yourself already at a very early age so for you maybe that leap wasn't as big as it sounds to me at least yeah i think um, how did i even get through it i don't even know i mean it felt it was difficult i think there was like certainly like the last few years before moving out it was just all very maybe also like starting to really pick up all those subtle cues or actually start processing those subtle, subtle cues as an adult well as a as a young adult child mm -hmm. coming adult kind of thing and you just realize actually those are really powerful forces uh, yeah like you can really show dislike 
and coldness and 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 rejection through actually not even saying a word um and just been working with those cues i guess for for all those years of, and then realizing actually i i'm legal enough to leave <laughs> to leave the house so so i did um and, was that a big like, fight did you have, did, was there a big fight to, to to make that happen i mean because i mean it's you know the which you kind of you you know said which is maybe a little bit cynical in a way but it's also income for them yeah true yeah it was more of an income for them uh it was a bigger fight with my parents because mm. i think my parents knew what was happening they always say um you know having patience it's such a strong skill to build mm. like you know you just need two more years of patience Right. But then I was like, well, technically I don't, and 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 you know that money, you know, I, I wasn't earning that, and I was like, you know, as, you know, that money can go into a, a lodger's rent very easily with like kind of food on top. Um, so right. it was harder with them saying it, announcing it to. I never planned this with my with the with my uncle and auntie when no, they never knew this until everything was planned, and um, and. Uh, Right. Uh, when I told them, it felt to me, it looked more as though they expected this to come. So I think they knew, they just, they just right. expected this conversation and there was no, um, no resistance whatsoever. Ah, okay. Did you expect yeah. that? Did you, did you expect the resistance or did you? Was it a surprise? I think like it would have been nice to have some resistance, but then right. I think I didn't expect it any resistance. Ah, right. As in like, you know, yeah, actually it'll be nice. Then you feel like, ah, oh, someone actually cares for you. But then you're like, well, Well, exactly. Wasn't. Yeah. Well, yeah, so to yeah. to what we we're earlier talking about, yeah. so you know, things like um so my and I so my kids are not threatening to move out. Yet, yet, <laughs> but my, my, but my daughter would be able. She could say things like, um, "Yeah, I think I would like to take have a. I think I would like to have a tattoo." So she could say that. So, so it's, it's on a different level. I know that. I know that. But there is this moment where you then, as a parent, uh, you know, want to kind of say, you, your brain goes like, "Do how do I? Yeah, how I respond to that because she's testing me." She's testing me. She's testing me. You know. So, uh, do I say? So, what are my options? I can say something like, uh, "All right, when you're 18, you know, you, you, you're in a, you're, you, you, or can I say like, "Never," you know, over my dead body, or do I say something like, uh, "Well, as, as long as it's on your face," or do I say? <laughs> so, these are scenarios in my head, right? So, or or I could say, "Well, if you are having a one a deer, then I'm going to have one too in my neck," right? So yeah. that's. All right, and uh, or what? What? So you that goes through your brain, like how do I? How do uh, I? But but you wanna? But she was she's asking for some resistance. Yeah, exactly. Right? Yeah, right. Because and if I we think, would have said, "Oh, fine, I don't care," that's really yeah. weird. Like that would be like yeah, you have to care. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think like for like yeah, like if you just didn't respond, just not mm -hmm. even like seeing you hesitate or process, I think I think that will like throw some alarm bells. I think just because maybe that's what. That's just me, I think, when I was young. There wasn't any, yeah, no one's going to discuss anything with us about tattoos or smoking or alcohol. You know, it was just, it was just, you do it or you don't do it. And, and they will not give a damn if you do it or not. And I think you, you just learn that by just not even explicitly saying it. You just learn it by the, by, by the expectation that's been set up. And, um, and, yeah yeah but you know like it's all like as a kid you don't see it but it's all just looking back having opportunities like talking to you right now about it you, you can really pick up actually like how did i what was the, the the things i held on to that kept me going and what was the thing that was challenging but what was the thing that made me happy at that time you know like yeah you become much more can you aware. give me an example of what exactly. made you happy what made me happy was um I think seeing faces and seeing like being surrounded, I think that makes me happy. Um, always like crowds for some reason. And maybe that's the thing. So that's something I read this morning just before 
our chat was the idea of teddy bears. Why is that? Why are teddy bears so important? And um, and um, I feel like, by the way, I'm turning this podcast uh, into like a child psychology. <laughs> one <to> one. <laughs> hey, <laughs> I'm just asking questions, man. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I used to collect loads of teddy bears. I don't know why. I used to surround my bed with teddy bears when I was really young. And yeah. um, and I, I grew up and I still I still have teddy bears. Like I mm. still got two or three at mm. least. And um, and I see like characters and people in them. And and you you don't do it's not about childishness. I think like it carries something what, what I read this morning, they call pro social behaviour. So from anyway, just going back to what I read this morning. They were the uh, Harvard, I think, um, did a did a report on this study around um, around teddy bears and around you know if you introduce a teddy bear to a workplace, how would it change people's behaviour? So mm-hmm. let's say you take a teddy bear, or they said a crayon, something that reminds you of a child uh, or children. Mm-hmm. Um, what changes? And they found they gave a group of adults uh, some tests to do. Uh, during these times, and they found that actually people are kinder and they show more pro-social behavior and skills. If you if they see a teddy bear in the room whilst working, which is really like, kind of, oh, that's quite strange because teddy bear is power, like rest with making children happy, not making adults happy, right? And then, and then they take this test a bit further where they then mapped out all these offices in this one area of the city and they map how many nurseries or schools or kindergartens in the area that could signify what the teddy bear signifies for workers, you know, in that district. And they found out the more, the more of like schools and kindergartens and, and things around your workplace, the more likely the workplace shows pro-social behaviors. Uh, they call it also moral behaviors despite, you know, it, it doesn't affect their work performance. And also their work performance or the company performance doesn't also, also affect any of this. It's just down to the fact that, you know, there are some kind of child resemblance in, in, your, in your space. And then I think like, oh, that's really interesting. Like, why do I still hold on to these teddy bears that I used to have when I was young? Especially, you know, as, as, as an Asian man being 34, still, still having two heavy bears, you know, it's still a bit weird for a lot of people. But then I think it really just symbolizes what, what, what's kind of missing when you become an adult, or maybe what I was missing when I was a child, that kind of companion, that kind of safety, that kind of, you know, uh, they call it like purity. I don't think it's purity. I think it's more to do with having a buddy that will never judge you that will always be the most reliable around. Um, so yeah, I was just making all this connection this morning of like, you know, yeah. and in this conversation, it felt like, you know, that made me happy. Actually yeah. having an inanimate object around mm. yeah. that reminds me of, you know, just a bit of safety, I think. Yeah. That's yeah. really yeah. interesting. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah. No, it's, yeah. it's yeah. and I, you know, I, I have, I, I, you know, my, my children have, well, my daughter now kind of, She's not interested anymore in teddy bears and, and those kind of um, uh, toy animals. My son obviously is. He has his big shark and a big and a big huge dog and a, and and he can't sleep without them. He has to have. He there are like three four animals. He needs to have in his bed. Uh, and if they're not there, uh, we have to go look for it. And uh, if he goes and if if he goes somewhere, he takes at least a shark. The dog, because it's also it turns into his pillow as well, in which he's also yeah. actually really filthy because he's like, but it's not like you know we can't wash the thing that, <laughs> that well. So I'm like okay, um, but uh, no, but that's that's yeah. really interesting. And my my uh, my my daughter, she had this uh, this kind of toy rabbit, and she would take every everywhere. We were on vacation one day, and we I was. In a ga- at a gas station and we had a, a sandwich there i think somewhere in mm. france north of france and mm. we forgot she put the rabbit down and we got into the car oh, and no. went to on um, vacation 
And uh, so, uh, and uh, she forgot. And uh, so we, we called the gas station and we, on the way back, we picked it up and yeah. it was really not on our way, but we had to go back for this, yeah. you know, this thing. And it's not like we, when we knew it was really important. I, in fact, I knew it was so important that in case she would mm. lose it because it, she, it was like, if she would, if, if that one went missing, you know, we yeah. had to look for it everywhere. I had, I had a, I bought two of them. So <laughs> I bought another one and it was in a, and I had it in the, in a box in, 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 in my closet. It just in case she would lose it. I had another one, but I didn't think about this because well enough, at least I didn't think, thought it yeah. through in that sense that when you use a toy and you know and you're, you're you know she chews on it and she sleeps on it and the whole thing becomes really not really no no it, it, it yeah. wasn't it used to be pink it wasn't really pink anymore and yeah. it was like you know, <laughs> and you know insides you know, the world crumbled and i don't know what happened yeah. to the thing so yeah. when i and i for and she never so we did actually she didn't yeah. really lose them at one point i thought i'm just going to show her the other one yeah. Should I, should I? As a surprise, like I, I, I put that one in, but the thing was like bright pink and fluffy and all new, and it was really. She was like, "What's that? What is that?" You're like, "What's going on?" <laughs> it's not the same. Yeah, it's not. Anyway, but it's so important. Uh, it yeah. was, yeah. It's, it's, it's such an important thing, and, and still, it's there. I mean, we can't. We're not going to throw it out. Uh, uh, no, it's no. first time. Uh, and again, I, yeah, I don't know why I brought that up as well. I'm thinking, you know, if I know why, is... <laughs> yeah, of course, but because what? it's no, of course, because this is sort of you growing up, yeah. and uh, you know, without parents uh, in a in a in a country where at first you don't even speak the language well enough to to kind of you know to connect and 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 still you know there's all kinds of stuff going on maybe not consciously but if you look back that, that's a yeah. you know it, you know it's it, it, it's almost i mean i think you yeah. could call it traumatizing um yeah. you know of course i mean it should be it should be yeah. if, if you're a human yeah. being <laughs> that should be traumatizing yeah. right <laughs> to a certain extent yeah. um yeah. uh and 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 in, in that sense uh, what i find remarkable is that your so I think guess specifically your father said, well, this is going to make you more tough, and maybe you did get more tough, and probably you did. But at the same time, uh, if I you know look at the person yeah. sitting in front of me, um, I wouldn't describe you as a very tough person at all because you're all about <laughs> kindness and happiness <laughs> and and spreading yellow and uh, yeah. you know <laughs> no but it's, it's like I, yeah well that didn't work <laughs> uh, yeah i try to make the link sometimes as you're a know, psychologist like, you're a fashion psychologist that wasn't yeah. the plan your father no. you, you were had to be like at least you know i don't yeah. know what he had in mind but like a tough business person or something <laughs> banker or yeah, something yeah, which by the way, my brother became a tough oh, okay. business person. The bank of, okay, so it's fifty percent success rate. Match that expectation. I don't know how. I don't know why. Really, I feel like you know, it's it's okay. It's um, yeah, yeah. I think there was when we were young, there was enough like in psychology terms, we call it like enough like early warning signs to show that actually this is not okay for for someone to grow up in. But um, but we did it. And I think maybe that's the way how I kind of learned to to just continue. Or maybe the way I learned that maybe that part, if it's missing for someone, it could be very empty, I think. Mm. I think the reason I went to psychology when I was, you know, I still feel, you know, this isn't my personal opinion, but I, I still feel asking someone 16 and 17 to choose a university degree that defines their career is still mm. too early, I think. I think no one really mm. knows what they want to do in their 16 or 17. But hey, you know, back then it was, um, it was either between fashion and psychology. And I that was, that was the two options you, 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 you had, you know, yeah, you said, it's to. either fashion or it's psychology. Or psychology, yeah. And you chose yeah. psychology. Yeah, I think because at that time it was the most difficult time in my life. And I mm. think, psychology resonated more mm. um, and I think it all came down to I just don't want people to to feel empty I think and um, and I think yeah like I was just fascinated by by you know how come all these 
things that goes on inside you is so powerful. You know, I, I, I'm not using any particular words because, you know, I wasn't even learning psychology. I don't know what psychology was back then. And I think I just called it like, you know, what's inside our brain that makes it so powerful that we create our own world in there that mm. we projected onto what's around us all the time. You know, mm. I could have interpreted the, uh, the experience of my guardian very differently, but I mm. didn't. Mm. And um, why did it make it different? Um, I think that's what led me to it. And that's what led right. me to like kind of really my mission, like always have this idea of like, I just don't want to see another person cry for no good reason. I think that's... Is that your that, mission? Yeah, yeah I believe it? in crying. Yeah, well, when I was doing the psychology, for sure, I think, you know, like seeing people sad, you know, to really pull it, you know, seeing that, seeing that feeling, seeing that scene when someone lose, let's say like when, when seeing your daughter lose her teddy bear, that's kind of like very, like, that's something that I really want to help people with. And, um, and and I think, you know, in, uh, when working in mental health services, there was not that kind of feeling, but there was a lot of, you know, time that you can really actually help people. And, okay, um, because uh, you were 16, 17, you moved out, yeah. you started studying yeah. psychology, right? Yeah. So, yeah. So, and, so, then, yeah. and how was, how was, how was that experience at, 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 at the university or, the, or college or where, 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 where did you go yeah, to school? Where was yeah. the school? So, uh, I moved out to finish my let's say high school. That's the most translatable, I think, like a degree or whatever it's called. And yeah. then and went into university in a place called Sheffield, uh, Sheffield which is yeah. even north, more north yeah. than uh, Nottingham. Mm -hmm. And then that was to learn this side of psychology. So learning about human behaviors, learning about, you know, the typical child psychology attachment theory, you know, what is addiction? You know, like it covered all aspects of, um, how does basically a human interact with the world? Right. As a child, as an adult, as an adolescent, with problems, without problems, and, uh, and, and really focus on what, what, makes, what makes us human. Um, and society, obviously. Mm -hmm. So that was probably the easiest part of my life, I think, that three years. It was, it was very structured. Um, everyone was very open, made really, really good friends during university time, like, everyone does anyway i think because everyone's in the same boat i mm -hmm. think everyone shares this kind of way of living uh, way of thinking and then after those three years it was then back to well then chose to move to london because right. um it was it was really exciting and and those three years really gave me strength to really think about actually i can do this and i can choose an adult life that i want to choose um, because I feel like, you know, and when you're 18, you feel very invincible, don't you? You feel like, yes, this is, uh, or 21, or when you finish uni, you're like, yes, you know, I can do this and all that stuff. Um, yeah, and I moved to London, then spent another, I think, nine years actually working in mental health services, continue getting more trained and you know, more specialized. Um, what kind of work did I, you do uh, in mental health services? I worked in, um, I worked in mental health hospitals. Uh, mainly mm. um, to help people with uh, learning disabilities. So um, it's, it's uh, for people with like mental health problems. It's you know life is hard, and uh, for people with you know other kind of difficulties in their life, it is also harder because a lot of times services are not really catered to anyone that that has you know that's that's different in any way. Mm -hmm. So um, I kind of went down that focus and uh, and had a really brilliant mentor that um, taught me about, you know, essentially psychology is not really about just being fascinated and helping someone. It's actually, you know, like that person, how would you help them to live their life they want to choose to live? So it became much more bigger than just focusing on their mental health. Um, and then, then just, yeah, just follow her with my career um, and then spent another two years uh, doing a research around what happens to people with learning disabilities that most of the time have mental health problems, but also being in prison. And uh, so this, this group became more niche, like the people that I started to really kind of think about um, and, and to see what happens because Usually, the statistics will show uh, people who are vulnerable 
that that has has a criminal record will will find it really hard to get out of this criminal cycle this mm-hmm. criminal community so mm-hmm. that was the work then and um and afterwards i was like i'm still really interested in fashion i'm still like you know i feel like fashion has a huge role to play with the way we feel about ourselves the way we deal with happiness and loss and and you know and and at the same time the uh the the creative side really is the bit i i think while really liking what i did learning about this kind of let's say humanity and kindness and and you know what makes a human flourish uh ideas flourish you know and community flourish but but also i really miss being creative so that's why i then trained myself in fashion psychology and um how did you how, then, well how did you make that leap how did you so since so you were in psychology you started so you started working you you did research and yeah. then what they went to study uh, fashion i just i just went I feel at the moment this is I was reaching 30 and and again such a such an immature age but again you still feel invincible <laughs> you're like I can do this I can do this if I have made like psychology uh, as a career that I enjoy I can always make fashion as a career I enjoy there was a catalyst there as well where it was um it was coming off the last recession so 2010 2012 mm. and then um i worked for a national health service in the uk so still government funded um but there were many cuts everywhere and the the outcomes for people well-being was very much shifted to a well, in my eyes to a very monetary way of thinking and i was like you know if if business is i think you know what what kind of a lot of people would say like a gravity problem, a problem that you can't change, then why don't I just go head on, be in the creative, somehow bring my kind of idea of psychology in, don't know how back then, and, and, and you know, like be, you know, be very transparent that actually we still work in a business model and, and you know, see, see what happens instead of just having that frustration every day working in, in the National Health Service where your, your outcome is very different to what the uh, trust, the organization outcome is. Um, so yeah, and, and also at the same time, uh, at one of the um, uh, fashion schools in London, they started a new course called Fashion Psychology. So I was the second year cohort for them. Um, wow. So I was, again, their guinea pig. And I continued. <laughs> <That's a theme. laughs> I continued, yeah, I continued, really defined what is fashion psychology to me, what kind of vision I have with what I do. And, and, and coming to Amsterdam, learning more, interacting more, got myself onto a little bit more of a marketing kind of communication course to really help me kind of define those ideas. And, and just, just, you know, just, just seeing how clothes can, or fashion can be a force for good through understanding the psychology side of it, the human mm-hmm. relationship we have with, with objects especially mm. the objects that we, we wear, that we put on. So mm-hmm. that's, that's how I got, got here. Yeah, and, it's um, not, it's and not a teddy bear, but it's, it is not similar. Not a teddy bear. But it is no, similar. No. There is a relation. <laughs> it is still, it's still whatever surrounds you. Well, you said, you know, I like to be surrounded. And to me, it's, yeah. like, uh, it's you know, it's, it's, it's also, I th- you know, I think there's a link to, to fashion there. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah. also, uh, and it's teddy bear, it's people, it's, it's the clothes you wear. Uh, exactly. it, it, you know, all these things have meaning. Um, um, yeah. But, it, but um, a fashion psychologist, so, and I, I understand sort of uh, the relationship between, obviously, you know, fashion and the way you feel and what you try yeah. to communicate and, um, and, mm. and you know, your, your identity and, uh, you know, it's, it's, mm. it's, it's relevant, um, you know, uh, especially mm. uh, if you also think about, you know, children, you can see different generations, different, you know, they, yeah. they're searching, like my daughter's searching for her identity through clothes. Um, yeah. and, and then nowadays it's obviously... Um, well, it's always been, especially for girls, obviously, uh, you know, mm. kind of tough because you can, you get all these images of these perfect people and, um, yeah. uh, and, and, and now more than ever, because it's, mm. you know, it's with them all the time mm. through Instagram and TikTok and everything is, 
you know, so it's, 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 so is that sort of the space that you are kind of uh, active in? Is that what you're, what you're dealing with? Yeah. yeah, yeah, I think it's focusing back onto why fashion matters. And I think that's a really good example of, of the way you said it, like, you know, for, for us building, especially when we're so prone to really trying out building our identities, you know, mm. it's, it's such an important way, exciting way to really build like what you think you are and to just mark the way you change. I think that's, that's really exciting. Um, and a lot of this came from just, you know, take that career jump working in fashion, started in retail, doing a lot of internships and starting different jobs and started then studying fashion psychology, meeting a lot of people working in fashion, is that a lot of people went into fashion with that idea in mind is that clothes is, you know, what more or less our second skin, like, you know, it's so personal and so selfishly important, but the way how the industry, fashion industry runs is so impersonal, so much about production, so much about um, replacement, so much about waste, um, so much about, you know, just just so so driven, I guess, uh, by growth. There's this disconnection between what is being kind of like the human and well-being side from, from what is a fashion business, uh, full stop. And my work is really to actually, you know, if we be able to actually really understand from a business perspective, from a fashion industry, I guess, perspective of what really drives people to, to build their wardrobe. What are, what's those special elements in there? What are the stories they try to say? You know, can we have better designs? It might not even be clothes. It might be, you know, actually something else that we've never ever imagined before. But let's not work with an end product where, you know, for our company for this season, we need to make 16 dresses, the style of dresses, you know, 10 shirts. Actually, maybe this season is making three shirts that actually, but most of our cost, most of our work is actually about community services, some kind of way of talking about fashion. Or, you know, these are, you know, but led by why do people need fashion? Mm. Full stop. And then, and then just, to experiment and see uh, what 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 how how would fashion change besides just talking about a product um, or or like you know what's what's new um, and yeah and also that's why I then start focusing on design thinking because design thinking to my knowledge it hasn't really been introduced to a fashion kind of uh, context except for gaining user insights of how to sell more and uh, how to get people to stay on your website for longer. Um, it's, it's very focused still. And um, I went to, uh, went to D school to, to do my thesis and uh, a, little, a little brief training then took it, took design thinking to, to a, a Parisian fashion house and really just defined what does it look like? You know, not, not every single step per se, but how would it fit into a fashion rhythm? And, and I think that's what kind of spurred me on to go, look, we can actually design better and or design something we've never seen before, which is really exciting, but ultimately meets the brief of why fashion matters for people. And um, and yeah, so that's that's why that's why I'm here. That's why um, that's why I'm, I'm kind of in the moment doing yeah, redoing every day. <laughs> See, yeah. So if you what does look, it look like, right? How does it change? Yeah. So if you so no, you know, you know, we we um we talked about a lot of things, and uh, I I'm curious, you know, because um, often you don't share these stories like in one go, like you know, <laughs> like from your birth to where you are now. But mm -hmm. if you if you if you would kind of connect things together. Sort of the way you were, you grew up, and um, um, mm. and and who you are now, and what you're doing, the way you look at the world. Mm. Um, how do you see? What did you? What did you take with you? Or how? What? What were the? Um, what are the things that have shaped you the most? What do you still recognize now in your character and the way you relate to other people, or the way, or the, or, or the work you do, or? Yeah, it's so hard. Yeah, like I think 
how do I relate? How do I see people? I think all the connections I have is people can upset you. People can just take you back in the childhood. You know, people might not align to the way that, you know, not everyone is going to do things in the benefit of others. But actually, you know, no one is bad. I think that is that is really a huge thing, a huge connection, especially now bringing it all back to now, you know, like just never thought my guardian is a bad person. Just never mm. thought, you know, the people that I worked with in mental health service, despite they might have committed horrific crimes, it's, it's just not necessary to see someone as bad. Mm. And then also in working in fashion now, it's very much, I'm sure you're aware of this, like fashion now, like most part of our society is showing where it's either you or me, you and them, uh, and, um, you know, because you don't believe in uh, slow fashion, you're a bad person. You know, like, or, you know, you can really see this kind of way mm. of how we, and I just feel like, oh, I really don't think it's, there is any, anyone that's bad. Um, mm. Because inside us, all of us is craving for this something. And, and if, whatever I can, uh, at least I can do, is to stop someone losing or having that, that feeling where they lost their teddy bear. That's really good way of doing it. Then, then I yeah. think I'm doing a good job. Like if I, if I can provide someone, you know, oh God, I sound so like design thinking, de-school business, <laughs> way of doing it. if I can meet someone's needs, you know, like, yeah. and, and actually help someone okay. thrive. That, that's crazy. I think that, that'd be great. Um, and also there's one interesting thing, which I, I don't know, maybe next time we talk more, you can help me with it. Um, I recently had opportunity to teach fashion psychology in, in, um, in pretty good like leading fashion schools around the world, which is great, which is, you know, that's how I would love to see how fashion psychology will grow um, to influence other kind of people who are training in classical fashion way. And I literally have like any topics I want to teach, I can teach it. So I taught a bit of what is creativity, what is imagination, what is design thinking, uh, what is, you know, design thinking in a sustainable angle. But I also had a mission of teaching about kindness mm. um, to, to fashion students, which I think it came across as quite bizarre for them. But I still don't really know why I really wanted to do that. I, I just thought it's a very important skill and perhaps it's a skill that made me, yes, I think that made me communicate first when I moved over here. Like, you know, actually people show kindness to me. The Scottish English tutor show kindness to me. Otherwise, you know, I was such a slow learner with language, but she did, you know. I, and, you know, the way I communicated with other people was through kindness. Um, and to this day, I'm still teaching it. <laughs> I, I actually, I, so I wrote down uh, a little bit earlier because of the, you know, you, because of this kindness um, topic, um, I, I wrote down uh, still, still looking for kindness or maybe it's more like continuously looking for kindness or it's this, because if I would link it and I'm not a psychologist, you're the psychologist, so you should know better, but I'm not. But to me, it is the theme of kindness is that the one thing that you've been missing when you were yeah. when you were a kid, when you were growing up, is kindness. There there is no kindness except for people who are not part of your family, but the people that 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 are that were actually, you know, supposed to show you kindness, you know, they were yeah. there but didn't show you kindness. They were just there and it was practical and it was sort of a you know, you had to kind of uh it was a it, it was it was for some it was almost more like business like for your parents, it had to do more with your future, and it, had, it was important to yeah. grow up tough, and 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 you know all these are you know and again I, you know these mm. probably are not bad people of course, but, yeah. but it is sort of this kindness, and uh, and that's why I think it's really yeah you know, to me it's it's sort of similar, you know in the sense that you know the teddy bear the fashion teaching yeah. people kindness you you also you you want to take care of people. You know, it's like I don't want I don't yeah. want people to be sad. I don't want them to lose their 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 um, uh, yeah. their teddy bear. And I think it's sort of something you missed 
yeah. uh, that you uh, that you're bringing back into uh, or that you, you took with you, and this is something um, that you are also, um, you know, probably. Okay. So I will tell you this: if you're <laughs> you're in your thirties. If when you're in your 30s, you know, again, I'm not a psychologist, but I've been in my 30s. <laughs> and I know that when you're in your 30s, you're, are you starting um, to be able to reflect uh, on your life? Um, oh. you're, you, you're starting to, to be able to kind of uh, distance yourself a little bit from you, you yourself, you're as a, oh. you know, and, and kind of see sort of the, 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 the the things that have shaped you and the, and the influence of your parents, who your parents were and who you are and the difference mm. between the two and what you took with you, et cetera, et cetera. So that's in your, in your thirties that you can start kind of to, to kind of be, be able to reflect on these things. And I think, so that's a really interesting age in that sense, yeah. because you can see those connections. And also that's quite a nice kind of just hearing someone saying it because I guess no one really ever said it, really. And um, it made me think of, like, why? Why do I want meaningful stuff happen, you know? Why do I want... Why sometimes I'm upset with businesses, especially certain uh, fashion businesses, where, where you know, the, it's all about being competitive. It's all about being strong. It's all about being lethal. And, and yet, you know, like, for me, you know, one of my kind of key things about... Talk about well-being, talking about... You know, like what would make, I, in my eyes, a, a fashion business survive is actually demonstrating kindness because maybe that's something has always been missing for me, but always I always notice it has been missing in a in a very typical business model and structure or environment, let's say. And um, and this idea of soft skills, right, that a lot of people talk about, and maybe that could be a good reason why I. I'm really attracted to this side of work and yeah, of course. and I really want fashion to 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 be a force of good because you know we should care about people regardless of if it's work if it's business it's still people involved or maybe it's just me still being needy <laughs> and uh, want everyone to, uh, to to dance around with teddy bears and bring their teddy bears. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah. who knows? <laughs> why not? Why not? Yeah. Why not? So true. So, yeah. So, I, 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 um, I hope you're going to find a lot of kindness, and I hope you're going to spread a lot of kindness. I think you do already. I think you are a very, oh. very kind person, <laughs> and I think the. Uh, your positivity or uh, you, you know, you radiate, you radiate that so that you're doing really well. So, <laughs> so, so, which is, I, yeah, yeah. Oh, thank God. Uh, uh, I think uh, it is an amazing story and um, thank you for sharing that. I think that's very powerful. I think it will resonate with a lot of people. I have a lot of other questions, um, <laughs> but that's for another time. Um, no, I mean, yeah. thank you for having me. I mean, I, uh, I, I, you know, when sometimes when when people ask you to talk about yourself, you you always just never think you're interested to talk about yourself. So I did know. If my story was interesting at all. This actually. is like a Hollywood movie. This is your Disney movie where the snow is, but then the snow has to be really white when you land. No, this is not. No, it's not a Disney. Yeah, it's not a Disney movie. Yeah. It's not a Disney like movie. My Disney story will happen on like HBO or something where there's a too much. Too much negativity going on that Disney yeah. can't handle. Or can't, I I think um, I think you should consider writing this down. No, I'm not. Yeah. It's not a joke. I'm, I, I'm yeah, no, I just thought well, I've never actually written anything like this. Now. Because I think there's a lot of people, um, especially people, uh, Asian people, uh, not just Asian people, but I think a lot of Asian people who, who've lived through this, who've been through this yeah. in, in, in one way or another. You know, it might not be all the same, but I think there's a lot of people who have experienced this. And, and I think you can be someone to show you know, the positive outcome and how to deal with these things. And, uh, and so, um, yeah, I think it's a very, I think it's an extremely powerful story. So thank you. I, I yeah. just never actually thought of it, but because I never, maybe I never told my stories. I never really 
so anyone will be interested. But this is this is actually yeah. quite quite yeah quite powerful to just hear that actually it's uh, it was all worthwhile. It sounds like. <laughs> 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 yeah so now you, now you can write a book and become rich and then uh, <laughs> no, finally in, finally in, make your parents not, happy yeah yeah as in like it was you know it was just just happening because it was happening i guess it was actually an interesting part of my life so that was actually quite well sure crazy yeah, to hear, of course. But yeah. yeah yeah thank you very much all right okay thank you for having me